advert, I think, for a, a meeting. Uh, uh, ah. Okay, uh, I wouldn't like to steal any of uh, the time uh, that Dan has for his talk. I just would like to announce very briefly that uh, the Iberian Streams, uh, you may know this is a, a yearly run a conference between Spanish and Portuguese string theory communities. So next year it will be in Oviedo, we will be organizing it. So uh, I invite you to to participate to this, uh, save the dates. This, would, this will be uh, 19, 20, and 21 in January. We have already the list of uh, confirmed uh, speakers, some of which uh, overlap with the speakers in this meeting. And uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we move on to uh, the next speaker. Was Dan Baldron, and he will tell us about um, stability, quotients, and the moduli of 4D supersymmetric flux backgrounds. Please. I have it on here. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. It's okay. And this is where I'm at. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Like everyone, I'm incredibly happy to be here. I didn't realize quite how happy I was going to be to be here, but I really am. Um, uh, and I hear that a video is a great place to visit, so I think you should all go to it. I'm, I'm going to go to every conference I can. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some work um, with Anthony Ashmore, Charlie Strickland, Constable uh, George Smith, and David Tennyson. George is my current student. I won't mention whether any of the others were also my students. Um, it's based on um, this group of papers, and mostly these two, one to appear, which is with George. Um, and just before I start, I also wanted to mention, actually, a lot of very similar work has been done. I'm going to talk about reductions to flat space, reductions to ADS, I did a lot of similar work with Ed Tasker, who was my student, who very sadly died just over a year and a half ago, very unexpectedly. So I hope that some of Ed's work will come out soon. Um, so I'm going to talk about a very old question, which is what are the massless moduli when I do a completely generic flux compactification to four dimensions, preserving supersymmetry? Um, and are those moduli counted by some cohomology? So we know when there's no flux, I do on a Calabi Yau or a G2 manifold or something, the moduli are counted by some suitable cohomology. Is, this, is there a similar situation when I have a background with flux? And I don't mean just backgrounds where I'm putting a small flux on, but I mean I'm looking at the, the full back reaction of the flux. So it could be type two models with brain worlds with some, with some large back reaction whole Strominger system as an example of this, which is the back reactive flux in, in the heterotic theory, or also heterotic M theory is intrinsically like this. So I'll remind you that there are some no-go theorems, which is that if you have a background, if you have a compact background with flux, then you have to have some sources around. So I'm actually going to not talk about moduli of the sources, but I'm going to talk about moduli of the bulk around, around the geometry. I hope the setup is clear. Um, I don't, well, I don't think I really need more, too much motivation. I think you can give your own motiv motivation, maybe the phenomenology. You can also do this for ADS CFT, and then it will tell you about marginal deformations and things like that. Um, so yeah, there's a long history of flux compactifications. I started writing down some references, and then I realized I was including almost everyone in the room, so then I just say everyone. So I don't want to, I'm gonna mess up with the references. So let me just remind you of what the setup is. So I'm gonna talk about, some background, some solution of the killing spinner equations. And the two cases I'm going to focus on, I'm actually going to almost all focus on the M theory case, but compactifying to four dimensions, either on a seven or a six dimensional manifold, will allow some warp factor of the four dimensional part, and we turn on some flux. So in the M theory, we turn on a four form flux. And if you had flux on the four dimensional part, you could equally well think of it as a seven dual seven form flux on the seven dimensional part. And that's what I'll do. 
And in type 2, then obviously you have the H3 and the Ramon Ramon fluff. Um, and so let me just remind you of the simplest example. So in a G2, when we turn off the fluxes, if you remember G2 geometry is, de is defined by uh, a three form, I'll call it phi, that's invariant under some G2 subgroup of the orthogonal group. So because it's a subgroup of the orthogonal group, if I give the, the phi, I also get a metric. That's called a G2 structure. And supersymmetry says that this phi is both closed and co-closed. That's what you might call an integrable G2 structure. And then you can ask, what are the moduli? And from the fact that this is closed and co-closed, well, you just do a little deformation, and the deformations will be co closed and co-closed co with respect to this metric. But that's just the same as saying the form is harmonic. And the space of harmonic forms is the space same as the space of the third Durand cohomology. So the deformations of phi should just be parameterized by the third cohomology. And then we could also turn on some fluxes. There was no flux here, but you could turn on some potential that had vanishing flux. And if I have a three-form potential for the four-form field strength, then that's another thing that lives in the third cohomology because it's three forms up to gauge transformations, and that just puts me straight into the third cohomology. So the moduli space here will be the sum of three for third cohomology for deforming, deforming phi and the third cohomology for turning on some background potential. So it's the same as the third cohomology over the complex numbers. Um, and there's no cohomology for the dual six form potential because the six co the six around cohomology vanishes on a G2. What's the case with no flux? What about some cases with flux? Well, that's a, in type two, right? We know that we can reformulate that problem uh, using generalized geometry. And I'm probably all remember this, that you can think of it as a pair of, the, the, the supersymmetry is equivalent to specifying a pair of, I, of odd forms and even forms. And they encode the never schwartz degrees of freedom. Um, if it was a Calabi-L, one would just be related to the symplectic structure and one's related to the complex structure. And the integrability says that one of them, let's do type 2B, say, one of them is closed. The other one is not closed. Part, part of it's closed. The other part gets related to the ramon ramon fields. So in some sense, this part is integrable because it's got a nice is it vanishing right-hand side. This one is not, not integrable. And when you start to try and look at the moduli, there's some nice work by Alessandro and also by Kerber and Matucci looking at this. And this integrable one, you can then describe using cohomologies that are associated with generalized complex structure. But when you try and describe these ones, it's more complicated because they're not, all, not integrable. So it's not quite clear what happens here. Okay, so the... Uh, that's the problem I want to try and look at in general. And um, the way to think about it is a very old and very simple idea, which lots of people thought about before, which is that if you just think about, let's focus on 11 dimensions, 11 dimensional supergravity on a seven manifold. If you keep all the Kaluza to climb modes, you can think of it as a four dimensional supergravity with an infinite number of fields. So you should be able to translate supersymmetry, the fact that you're preserving some four dimensional vacuum, some flat four dimensional part, into conditions on the manifold, which should be able to translate them just into this four-dimensional language. So it's just going to be a language of super, of, of, uh, super potentials and moment and uh, D terms and so on, F and D terms. So what I'm going to do is review something that's incredibly familiar to you, which is just N equal one, super, super symmetric background. But I'm going to try and argue that it's connected to something in, uh, that's for, that appears in mathematics, which is called uh, notions of stability and, and geometrical invariant theory. So let me just review stupid things so we're in four dimensions we have some matter they'll be generally be, there'll be some chiral multiplets their scalars will be some complex numbers which parameterize a Kähler manifold and i'm going to call this that's so it's got a symplectic structure pi and a complex structure and there's some Kähler potential okay and in the background right if you remember in supergravity this is actually a Kähler hodge manifold that puts some restriction on the on the pi but you could also go to the total space, which is where you sort of do a U1 vibration, uh, do a line vibration over this space. That's like going to the, going to the uh, conformal supergravity. So I'll secretly be in that, in that picture, but don't worry too much. It's okay, I'm on a manifold. With a super potential. And there's a gauging. So in general, there may be some action on this space, which preserves the Kähler structure. 
And you can, given that action, there'll be an infinitesimal action of the corresponding Lie algebra that will correspond to a set of vector fields on this space that do the infinitesimal motion. They preserve a symplectic form. So in general, that means if you contract this vector field that generates this direction into the symplectic form, it has to be closed. If it's exact, then this function here is the moment map or the d-term. So you can think of the moment map as a map from the space into the dual Lie algebra. And then supersymmetry, as you know very well, there are f-terms which tell you that the derivatives of the superpotential vanish. That puts you, these are holomorphic conditions, so it puts you on some holomorphic subspace. So the subspace will also be Kähler. And then finally, there are some d-terms, which are the vanishings of these moment maps. And they can be thought of as a symplectic reduction. So you set the moment map to zero, and then you mod out by the group, because any two things ready by the group are equivalent. That reduces twice as many dimensions as there are in the group, and that's the symplectic reduction. And the resulting thing will again be a Kähler space, as you want, because the space uh, of moduli should also be supersymmetric. So, super so now what I'm going to say is we can think of the second term actually in a slightly different way. So if you go back and look in Wessenbagger, they say that you can solve for the super potential for the D term, sorry, for the moment map, the D term. And you can think of it as being written in terms of the Kähler potential. So I had these vector fields that generate the motion of the symmetry. And I've got a complex structure, so I can take the complex uh, conjugate, I can act on them with the complex structure. I get another vector field. And then I can take the Lie derivative of the Kähler potential along that direction. And that's actually the same as the moment map of the Z term. So if you like, this is like the motion along some, if I complexified the group, it would be along the imaginary bit of the complexified group. And from this relation, you see that the vanishing of the moment map is the same as going to an extremum of this Kähler potential moving along the complexified group. In the real part of the group, the Kähler potential doesn't change because it's invariant. But in the imaginary bit, it can change. And the vanishing of the moment map is the same as going to an extremum. If there's one extremum on each action of the group, GC, the complexified group, then I can get another picture of the moduli space. Instead of being this symplectic reduction, I can think of it as modding out by the complexified group. Because each orbit will have some extreme. So that picture is actually nothing other than what mathematicians call geometrical invariant theory. So there's a question, if you have some complex space and you have some group action on it, when can you, how can you understand whether you can reduce by that, by that group? And in general, there's a notion, so this is again what I was just writing. This here, these polystable points are the ones which do have an extremum on the orbit. So here are some orbits acting under this imaginary part of the group. These points here are called polystable because when you act along the, uh, with the orbit, they hit the uh, vanishing at the moment map. This would be an unstable point because it would never, never hit the vanishing. And the nice thing is that you can translate, even without solving the moment map, you may, by knowing enough about the orbit, be able to argue that it has to have a minimum. And that's the idea of geometrical invariant theory, is you try and make some arguments to say, well, even if I can't find a minimum, I know there has to be one, and so I know which are the stable points and polystable points, and hence I can work out what this space is. So my message is that, as physicists, we sort of already knew about this just by looking in Western back, right? It's just the relation between the Kähler potential and the, and the D terms. And you can then think about the moduli. And the moduli, if we think of it in this picture of modding out by the complexified group, um, oops, sorry, they are, so there'll be some F terms, which are just variations of the superpotential. If I just do some linear variation of the, of the, of the moduli, there's some, some tangent space, this will give me some, some matrix acting on here has to be zero. But then also I can think of the D terms as acting by the complexified group or here infinitesimally, the complexified Lie algebra. And um, if these are parameters of the complexified Lie algebra, then I get again some matrix running those to the variations of the coordinates themselves. And if I stick this in there, it's automatically zero. So I get a complex. And so the cohomology, at least in the, in the neighborhood, is always calculated. It's this moduli space is always going to correspond to some cohomology here. So I'm just thinking about the things that satisfy the F terms up to complexified gauge transformation. 
So this picture, uh, you can extend it to think about infinite dimensional spaces, and it underlies lots of uh, the mathematics of trying to understand solutions of famous differential equations. So as I'm sure you know, the Hermitian and Young-Mills equations, which are the equations for supersymmetric uh, field con Young-Mills configurations on a Kähler manifold, uh, they can be formulated in F and D terms, and you can think of them exactly in this language. You can similarly do the same reformulation of Kähler einstein metrics on the space. That's what uh, Donaldson recently did. Uh, the sort of F terms are like saying it's Kähler, and then the D term is like saying that it's constant curvature. So you get Kähler einstein and in that case, so the first case, the gauge transformations, the G was just the full set of gauge transformations. In the second case, it corresponds to some set of uh, some Hamiltonian symplectomorphisms on this Kähler space. But the nice thing here is what the, what the mathematicians did was exactly what I mentioned. Rather than solving these equations, you argue that there must be stable orbits, and then that tells you, tells you much of what you need to know. So this is going to be the idea of what we want to do to try and find the moduli in the general flux case. Let's start out clear to people. Okay. So we want to do the same picture, but for four dimensional n equal one backgrounds. And so the kind of questions we need to know is first, what's going to be this space, which is going to be the space of uh, the, the Kähler space? What's the superpotential? What's the group? And what's the cohomology going to be? And the idea is that exceptional generalized geometry gives you a natural way to reformulate the problem in exactly this language. So roughly where I'm going, I'm going to tell you how to reformulate it, and then I'll focus on the M-theory case and see that it can give us some, uh, some new results. Okay, so as I said, let's focus on the M-theory, but we could equally well have done type 2. Um, so I need to start by telling you a little bit about ge exceptional generalized geometry. Um, so the idea, as I think you have all heard, is that it unifies the symmetries in the fields of the supergravity. In a seven-dimensional manifold, I have metric, three-form, the dual six-form. Again, that's this field strength, seven-dimensional field strength, which is basically dual to the field strength in the four-dimensional part of the space, and this warp factor. Those are, those are my bosonic fields. The symmetries are parameterized by infinite infinitesimally by diffeomorphism, so by some vector, some two-form gauge transformation of A and some five-form gauge transformation of A tilde. And you can package these things together into, together with, uh, you can put them together into a large tangent space, which is the generalized tangent space. And in this case, you need to add one more thing, this tau, which lives in this strange T star, tensor wedge seven T star. This is sort of the parameter that's wanting to parameterize the uh, dual graviton diffeomorphisms. But in this case, it doesn't actually play any role um, because those symmetries don't appear yet. And so you have to go down one more dimension before they actually appear. So it just sort of hangs around for the right. Um, and on this space, the point is that on this bundle, uh, it forms a 20, uh, oh, not 27, 56 dimensional representation of E7. And so there's a natural action of V7, and that gives you a way of thinking about generalized tensors. So if I can find other combinations of ordinary tensors that transform in representations of V7, that's a generalized tensor. So let me just focus on two of them. The uh, adjoint is the 133 that has in it three forms and six forms. And then there's another representation, which is the 912. I've written a three here because it's got some weight under this R plus action. Don't worry too much, but its leading term is just ordinary functions. Then there are three forms, and then there are higher things that have more uh, down indices in. The nice thing in this formulation is that there's a notion of a generalized derivative, which gener acts on generalized tensors, and it generates the symmetries of the supergravity. So it's basically a Lie derivative part, and then some action which is doing the gauge transformations. And dw, d omega is a three form, d sigma is a six form. So those things live in the adjoint. So I can just take the adjoint action of these two things. That's what the generalized Lie derivative is. And it generates these the symmetries of the supergravity, which are sometimes called the generalized diffeomorphism group. And then there's a generalized metric, which is, lives in E star tensor E star, like an ordinary metric, it's a metric. Um, 
And in particular, it's invariant under the maximally compact subgroup, and it encodes all the bosonic fields. And then finally, the supersymmetry parameters can be repackaged into representations of the maximally compact subgroup. So in this case, it's the eight dimensional representation of the eight of SOA, just the fundamental. So now we can think a little bit about the background we want to look at. We want to preserve one supersymmetry. So we're picking out one of these epsilons. So we need to specify the background fields. That's the generalized metric. And we need to specify epsilon. Together, those th two things are invariant. Well, the background metrics are invariant under SU8. The epsilons, are gonna, if I pick out one of them, will be invariant under SU7 inside SU8. So fixing the unequal one background is like fixing some SU7 subgroup in E7. So we call that an SU7 generalized structure. It's just like the structures you form like in G2 or in Calabria. Okay, so what we're gonna be interested in is the space of generalized structures and then understanding what the supersymmetry conditions are on. Um, let me just say something. Okay, so how can we understand these structures in a bit more detail? So lots of people have gone back and looked at, looked at this problem before, and locally, the, the, the killing spinner locally defines an SU3 structure. That means it locally th makes the space look like a product of uh, an R and some six-dimensional space. And on the six-dimensional space, it's like a Calabi-Yau. It's, it's got a putative symplectic form and a putative holomorphic three form. So you locally get these three objects, a one form, which is in the direction along R, and then omega and the two omegas, which are the SD3 structure on the six dimensional space. And you also get a function that's related to the norm of the spinner. And then you've got your gauge fields and you've also got the warp factor. Now, all these things can be thought of as giving me a particular generalized tensor, which lives in this 912 representation. So all the different SU3 structures I can have can be parameterized by a class of objects in this 912 representation that are all related by E7 transformation. So they live in some particular orbit, all in a single orbit. When I think about breaking it down into the SU3 things, when I think about sort of going back to ordinary structures, it turns out there's two types of object in this orbit. And the key thing is that I told you that this representation starts with just functions and then the next thing's three forms. So the generic case is that the starting bit is a function. That's what I'm running here is this function that's built out of the, out of the warp factor in this angle. And then you act on that with the adjoint action of E7. And I told you that has three forms in it. That's what this chi is. It has three forms and... Uh, and six forms, that's the ordinary just gauge degrees of freedom. The chi is some particular combination of the SU3 structure and the angle. So this tie, this, so the generic cases like this starts with functions and then these things will generate higher bits in the, in the bundle. That's what we call type zero. It's possible that this function vanishes and so the first thing you get is a three form. And then what appears is just this holomorphic three form. And then again, you can transform it by something in the adjoint. So that type is type three, and that corresponds to the case when chi is zero. So these are all in the same E7 orbit, but once you break it into the ordinary geometry, you see two different types of structure. And if you're used to generalized complex structures, this is just the analog. And then just to say, if you take the special case where the angle is a half pi, then that's the G2 case. So in that case, uh, you actually just have a G2 structure. And it's very simple. A G2 structure is you just take the function to be one and you just act with the three form of G2 in the adjoint action, but as an imaginary adjoint action in the E7. Okay, so this space of structures which we can think of as specified by these psi's. And it turns out that that's the set of, sp that space of structures, which is some big infinite dimensional space, has a natural Kähler structure on it. And the Kähler potential is just given by some E7 invariant. Don't worry exactly what this is. So there's some natural E7 invariant you can write down. It gives the Kähler potential on the spaces, big space of structures. This Kähler potential is actually in the G2 case. It's nothing other than the Hitchin functional for G2, if you know what that is. But at this point, there's just some Kähler potential. 
Okay, so I've got the first bit, I've got like the analog of, in the n equal one language, I've got the space of chiral fields. So now I need to look at the supersymmetry and I need to impose first some set of F terms and then some D terms. So the F terms, you can write down a superpotential, which is sort of some extension of the old beasley witten superpotential it's first written down. Or you can think about it another way and let me think about it in a slightly different way. So one thing you can do is write down the superpotential and extremize it, but let me think about it in a slightly different way. It turns out that this SU7 structure, when I'm at pick one of these five, one of these psi's, it actually gives a decomposition of the generalized tangent space into four separate things by complexifier. And you should think of this as the analog of if I have a complex structure, it decomposes the general, the ordinary tangent space into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. So instead of two things, you get, you get four things. And this F term condition can be reformulated as an involutivity condition on a sub bundle here. So if I take two things that live in L3 and I take the, the generalized derivative of one with the other, it also lives in L3. And if you know about complex structures, that's exactly what happens, right? An integral complex structure is one where you take the Lie bracket between the, bit, the holomorphic vectors and it's again a holomorphic vector. Um, and furthermore, uh, if you take this condition, it automatically means this is anti-symmetric, whereas generally it's not. So we sometimes call this thing an exceptional complex structure because it's the exact analog of a complex structure. So these SU7 structures are like exceptional, they're like complex structures. Okay. The fact that this is involutive means that it forms a Lie algebroid. And if you have a Lie algebroid, you have a natural cohomology. So really, I'm just trying to get to you. We want to end up talking about cohomologies. We've already got some natural cohomology here. So it looks sort of hopeful. Okay, so that's the F term. What about the D term? There is indeed some moment map. And it's just the moment map of all the symmetries. So the set of symmetries you had with a supergravity transformation, diffeomorphism and gauge field, and gauge transformation, you just act with that on this space and it gives you a moment map. Uh, and vanishing of that moment map is equivalent to supersymmetry. So if we think about this in the GIT picture, we can think about some integrable structure here, some, so that's the F term, that's the, it's gonna look like some exceptional complex structure. And then we mod out by complexified versions of these diffeomorphisms. And when you do that, as, you, as we sort of anticipated, it pre precisely writes the moduli space in the neighborhood in terms of this cohomology that is naturally defined by this involutive structure. So the coho, picks up the third and the sixth cohomologies here. So generically, we've now got a formula which tells you what the moduli are for any flux buffer. And I'll just make a comment that um, you could imagine things where you have type changing. In this case, you can, where so something is mostly type zero and at some points it becomes type three. Uh, if that happens, then you necessarily have a singular background. Something goes wrong with the, with the warp factor. You might have to, you have to have some sources. Of so, okay, I've given this to you in some abstract cohomology. That's not very helpful. Let's look at it in a little more detail and I'll translate this into something that you, that you know. So let's start with type zero. Let's assume we have a type zero background and do its moduli. Now, the point was this thing, if you remember, I said it starts with this real, with this thing that's just a function and then um, it acts on it by some adjoint action to generate other things. And so the fact that the leading thing looks like a function, it turns out that this cohomology that we define is actually equivalent to the Durham cohomology. So you can work out what this cohomology is, it's just the Durham cohomology. And furthermore, supersymmetry, just the F terms, means that the cohomology classes of the flux have to vanish. So, before I told you that these cohomologies were the third and the sixth, so we're now going to get the third Durham and the sixth Durham cohomology. That's just like what we got for the G2 manifolds. And indeed, if I to restrict to G2, I precisely get the moduli space to be the third Durham cohomology over the complex numbers, and this thing vanishes. What about if I turn on some fluxes? Well, we said that we have to have some sources. So let's imagine excising the sources. So let's just take the space. Here's a source. Let's just cut it out and make the space have a boundary. 
Now, the fact that this cohomology class is still vanished means that you can't have at least a conventional like M5 brain source or something, uh, even once you've excised it. So if we're restricting to type zero, it seems that we can't have backgrounds which include any flux, and we're forced into the G2K. Um, there are singular solutions that are type changing that exist. They were found by Lucas and Safran. But if we say we can't have type changing, then it seems like we're forced into, type, into, into G2. And this is kind of interesting because I told you that you could think about these stability proofs for the existence of, the, of solutions. So Calabi Yau theorem is like that. So you might ask, is there some Calabi Yau theorem for G2? Now, there isn't a natural way of doing that if you think about it in ordinary geometry, but when you put it into the exceptional geometry, things get complexified. There's a Kähler space, you have a GIT picture. And so this looks like this might start giving you some idea of the existence of G2. And there are, there are uh, sort of out there, there are some uh, conjectures for how that might work and then indeed match into what we're doing here. So I can tell you a bit more, but let me keep going. I've run out of time. Uh, the other one you can do is type three. So I'm running out of time, so no, let me not tell you very much. But the point is that that's got no functions, but it's got three forms. And what happens now is that the, this funny cohomology essentially decomposes into the Bo cohomology on this six dimensional space. You've got a, one extra direction, and so you really get a bit more than Debo, but essentially it's Debo. It's something you can calculate. In this case, the flux is allowed, and there's no, there's no seven-form flux, but there is five, there's four-form flux, and that's, you're allowed to have five brain sources. So again, you can calculate. That's, that's the main thing I want to get stressed, is that you can calculate exactly what the moduli are here. So let me just give a classic example to see how this works. So um, ages ago, uh, people looked at um, the heterotic model of uh, the heterotic, the M theory version of the heterotic string compact in Clavial, and geometrically it looks like some six dimensional manifold, some orbifold interval. You have two boundary planes where the gauge fields live, and to first order you can take the six dimensional manifold to be Clavial and the flux vanishing, but the boundaries source the flux. So in general, you have to have some flux in the middle here too. And in the old work, what we did was we did some linear approximation and we showed that the moduli space of this thing under this linear assumption, you just take the first order correction due to the flux, is the same as the moduli space of the heterotic string, which is what you would expect on a clavier. But now we can do that much more generally. We don't have to make the, the approximation. And what happens is those two cases, the one where you have just Calabiao and the one where you have the full back reactor geometry lie on the same orbit here. So that means we can uh, calculate the moduli space using this point or this point, doesn't matter. So the fact they're on the same orbit means that the moduli spaces will agree. So the, the linear one we did and, the, and the, uh, the full thing. So this proves that actually the moduli space of heterotic M theory is the same in general as the moduli space of the whole Strominger system of the dual, um, the dual heterotic picture. What we've done, we've included all the Kaluza Klein mode corrections in that. But there are no D0 brains in the heterotic theory, so it's not surprising there's no correction. It doesn't lift anything. Okay, I should stop. But I hope I've given you that there's a natural picture of stability GIT and supersymmetry. You can extend all this to other theories as well. Uh, and generalized geometry gives you a nice way of calculating these, these cohomologies that I think would be very hard to do without the structure, the structure of the generalized geometry. Um, and I said that it's indicating some new mathematics and particularly these ideas about stability of G2 manifolds. Okay, I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Maybe I can start by making a few comments about your early, the early slides where you were discussing uh, the um, um, complexified and the moment maps and so on. This, in the context of, uh, of a supersymmetric sigma models, this was this is described in a paper by in a very old paper by Hitchin and us, uh, me and Martin, and uh, and the um, 
Taylor reduction you talked about is the Marston Weinstein reduction. And the hypercalar reduction is what we constructed there. And, the, and it, it, how it's related to sigma models and, and, and the gauge symmetry is also, you can also find in there. Stability we used as well, and that's uh, what we used at the time was uh, Mumford stability, which uh, comes into play. So the background to what you, you, you've been looking at. I should have said so, I'm sorry, that's no, no, just no, a comment that I wanted secret. to make. Then uh, are there other questions? Yeah. Martin? Maybe you mentioned it, but I but I missed it. But the reason for the nine twelve representation to appear is it the same as uh, uh, the way it appears as as the um, embedding tensor? Not really. It's just can you find a tensor that is stabilized by the group uh, SU seven? Sure. And. Um, this is the lowest, this is the smallest representation for which that happened. Okay. I would expect there to be some, some other reason coinciding though. But. Yeah, you can think of it, I mean, you can also think of it in terms of constructing fermion bilinears, which puts it straight onto that. Okay. So if you think about it in terms of SU8, you can see it. Is it, so the, the orbit you are, you are using is the minimal orbit? Um, yes, it's the minimal orbit. Okay. I, um, I was just wondering how easy is it to deal with type changing backgrounds? Uh, would you then just stick to the seven picture? Or? So there's two slightly different possibilities. So if you have type changing, it has to be singular. So from some point of view, you're going to go outside the supergravity approximation, so there's nothing you can do. Um, if you take a slightly weaker structure, U7 structure, that could not be singular. So maybe you can still say something about the moduli there. But the, um, so it's like, imagine you have a, a singular source there, but there's still some moduli you can think of sensibly. Um, and, but to do that, the cohomologies won't reduce to these simple cohomologies, you know, there'll be more something related to some foliation. Thanks. Right, um, more questions? If not, then uh, there it looks like there there is uh, a question from um, from the uh, uh, online people. Uh, Andre, is it? Can read it out. Shall I read it out? No. So Andre asks, can the can the polystable orbits hit the moment map locus more than once? So uh, yeah, that's a good question. So in the normal stability picture, you make some um, convexity arguments. So you have this orbit, and it goes large at two ends, and so it has to have a minimum somewhere. So if you're going to argue it goes large at two ends, and it has to have a minimum. That's where the that's where the moment map's going to vanish. Um, these moduli, these spaces we get actually have non-positive definite signature on them. So you can't make that same kind of argument. So in principle, you could have cases where it hits it twice. So yeah, that's a bit subtle. But... Thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Dan again.
So the next speaker is Friedrich Wallach, who will tell us about exceptional algebraids and poisson Lee u duality. Please. <coughs> Uh, let me just try the. Okay. So first, let me thank to the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk here about the work that I've been doing recently with together with my collaborators, which are uh, Mark Bagden, Andre Hooligan, and Moldram. So the papers are already on archive. <clears throat> you can you can look there for more details. So since I, the audience here is quite wide, I will try to be um, less technical. So the point of this talk is to <clears throat> give some introduction to exceptional algebraids, which is a mathematical structure we introduced in these papers in order to study some phenomena in, uh, in exceptional geometry, such as Poisson U duality or consistent truncations. So before getting into that, uh, let me say, uh, let, let me give you a parallel with, uh, with the ordinary story of, or more ordinary story of generalized geometry. So, Suppose we want to study the following question. So, so, there, so first, there, there exists an object which is which is handy in many applications in string theory. It's called the generalized tangent bundle. Um, so this is just the direct sum of a tangent and cotangent bundle. So sections of that are given by vector fields and one forms. And there is a, and the claim is that there is an interesting bracket on on these on this section which is given by this formula. So people call it the Dorfman bracket usually uh, in the physics community. And uh, yeah, you can twist it by some three form. And uh, yeah, so the claim that I'm making is that this is a useful object and it's, it's, it, it appears in the study of symmetries of, of the theories in hand, etc. cetera. And uh, <clears throat> uh, somewhat tautologically, this thing is equipped also with, a, with some sort of natural scalar product, which is given by simply by pairing vectors and covectors. Okay, so now, in, it might happen sometimes that you can, if you have such a generalized tangent bundle, that you can find a, a global frame, well, let's say orthonormal one, which has constant coefficients. So if you take, if you use the door, if you take the bracket, then the coefficients that you get will actually be constant. So this is a rare thing. It, it's not, you know, just some manifolds that admit it. So you can ask a question: What are the compact manifolds that do admit such a parallelization? So this is the question I want to ask in this motivational part. So um probably there are other ways to reach this goal but like a, a particular nice one is to embed this whole thing into a slightly larger world so and that is the world of current algebra it's so um yeah i doesn't want to switch is it because uh, is it because okay yeah okay thank you okay so so quorum algebra, it's without going into technical details, that's just uh, basically the structure that you saw here. So it's some, some vector bundle, let's call it E in general, a bracket on the space of sections of that, and in a, in a product, and then there is some map which is kind of implicitly present here when you take here, you take, just take a projection to the TM. So this, this map is called the anchor map. So probably you've seen this thing at some, in some different incarnations or some different stories. And, the, <clears throat> the, and this is subject to some conditions which I'm not going to, explain in detail but basically they tell you that these structures kind of you know they preserve each other you know the, just the nicest condition that you can imagine and then there is one condition which says that actually this bracket here is not skew symmetric so uh it, it has a symmetric part and the symmetric part is kind of governed by this inner product so if you have two sections which are orthogonal to each other then the bracket of them is skew symmetric but if they are not then it's not and uh, so it, in this aspect, this differs from the usual Lee algebra or like more standard Lee algebra picture. And now the examples for that. So I didn't tell you the details, but it's actually not necessary for, for what follows. So first example is the one from the previous slide. So the generalized tangent bundle. Here the row, as I said, is just the projection onto the first factor. And kind of a, a second interesting class of examples is given by you know the opposite extremal extremal case when you take in the definition you take the bundle over a point so you take m to be a point in that case vector bundle is just a vector space and rho becomes rho is necessarily zero and this bracket and inner product actually give this this vector space structure of a Lie algebra with an invariant pairing which is called uh, quadratic Lie algebra usually so i will call it d so this is math math frag d and so well so, so those are the two most important classes of examples for us. 
And now, kind of a crucial point in, in all of this, so I told you that the strategy to answer this question would be to embed this thing into a wider area, and in this wider space of current algebraids. Now, the question is, how do I recognize if I am given a current algebraid? How do I recognize if it is of this form? Because if I'm just given a random current algebra, I mean, it's probably not. I mean, it doesn't have to be written in this form. It can be written in a different form, and you may just ask, like, when is the algebra actually of this form secretly? And there is a famous answer by Pavel Shevera, which says that for every current algebra, there is a there is a sequence, and uh, there is a natural associated sequence. And if this sequ and uh, the algebra is of the form of the generalized tangent bundle, if and only if this sequence is exact. And that's kind of very nice and conceptual. In particular, you don't need to know anything about, I mean, yeah, from this you can then derive that the bracket has to have this form and everything else. So we know now how to recover the original class of examples. And now we can go back to Leibniz parallelizations. So recall that if, we, if you have a parallelizable algebra, so it means that you have some global frame which has constant coefficients of, of its commutators. Then this basically means that the that the vector bundle can be written as a product of the manifold with a vector space, and if you if you think about it, it actually means that this vector space has an inherits the structure of the bracket and of the of the pairing. And moreover, this is done in a way that it actually becomes this E prime becomes a Courant algebra over a point. So that's basically the same statement as here. That I'm saying that this this these guys are actually constant. So to sum up. Whenever we have a parallelizable Courant algebra, it actually gives you a product. It, it gives you a manifold and and a Courant algebra over a point, which from the sl previous slide we know that it's just a Lie algebra. Okay, so now now if we go back, then actually for a parallelizable or actually for any any algebra, since the since the algebra can be written as a product, then the anchor map the, this this row is actually the same as well. If you if you if you really write down the condition, it just tells you that there is an action of the Lie algebra on the manifold. So an infinitesimal, like if you take the group, you know this would be like the infinitesimal version of that. And uh, now, if you if you remember, okay, if you, if you focus, if you use this theorem, and uh, you just focus on the exact on the case when this uh, sequence is exact, if you call exact current algebra, it, and if you suppose furthermore for simplicity that the base manifold is compact, then First of all, if this sequence is exact, it tells you that the row map is surjective. So if you translate it here, it means that you have a surjective, you have a transitive action of a of a, of a Lie algebra on a manifold, and this basically means that the manifold has to be of the of the of the form D mod H. So D is the Lie group corresponding to D, and H is some subgroup. So at this so, so to summarize at this point, because this slide is slightly more technical. So whenever you have a parallelizable exact current algebra, which means parallelizable such thing which means a thing that we are interested in, it actually gives, it actually corresponds to a pair of a, of a Lie subalgebra of a quadratic Lie algebra. And well, conversely, you can ask, like, is it, does every, every subalgebra of a quadratic Lie algebra give you such a thing? And the answer is no, because there is some further condition. So for instance, you can easily derive that um, if you look at, at this guy here, and you look, look at the kernel of the anchor map that's given precisely by the second factor, and the second factor is half dimensional and it's isotropic. And just playing with it a little bit, you can see that one condition is that this, this subalgebra has to be Lagrangian. So, okay, now let me summarize this, this little technical discussion. So, uh, so what we have shown is that whenever we have a parallelizable exact current algebra, then this gives rise to a quadratic Lie algebra and the Lagrangian subalgebra thereof. So Lagrangian, I don't know if I said this, Lagrangian means that it's, it's, a, it's, it's a subalgebra which is isotropic with respect to the pairing here, and it's half dimensional. And now you can, if you look in the, in the standard literature on current algebra, you, you find that this is actually one-to-one -one correspondence, modulo some details, which I'm swapping under the rug, but basically. Uh, so one in pairs, which is a different name for this structure, is the same. I mean, it, there's a correspondence between those and parallelizable exact current algebra. It's, and at this point, you can you can say also what is the Poisson Lie duality. Um, so in this language, it just means that you have you have same D but two different ages. That's 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 what it is. And the reason that it's called Poisson Lie duality is that by the previous discussion, these two guys give rise to two exact current algebras over the quotient manifolds. 
for instance, if in the special case when, when these two subalgebras are transfers, these quotients can be identified at least locally with the, you know, with the other group. And these things are known in, in the literature as Poisson Lee groups. So that's, that's why the name Poisson Lee comes from. And the duality statement is that if you now put some dynamical structure on it, which I will not go into the details, if you put some dynamical structure on this D, then it gives rise to sigma models on these two target spaces, on these two guys, seen as target spaces for the string sigma models. And the claim is that they are dual. And you can make this more precise if you wish, but let me not go into that. But, uh, but uh, yeah, but basically what it goes to in this language of quadrant algebra, it just means that you have one quadratically algebra and two different Lagrangians of that. And you can have, I mean, you can ask like, can I have more? And the answer is yes, you can have more. So you can, it's probably better to talk about plurality by, uh, suggested by Um And, uh, yeah, so I should also say at this point, this is not the most, this is, this is kind of the simplest incarnation of Poisson Lee duality. There is a more general version, which actually uses or needs pretty much to, to, to know about current algebra. So, so this case that I'm showing here is kind of simple, but probably you can do the, all these analysis with, without using current algebra, but if you really want to talk about like normal Poisson Lee duality in this general setup or like what is called uh, generalized, Sorry, dressing cosets, then you need to know about current algebra. Mostly. So, okay, so that sums up the, the motivation. So, so the motivation is that to answer this, this question, which compact manifolds admit a parallelization, like this Leibniz parallelization, the answer is that you need to look for these pairs of a Lie algebra and a Lagrangian subalgebra of that. And now let me go to the exceptional setup. Uh, so in the, in, in the study of M theory or it's, well, or you don't have supergravity and its reductions, uh, people use different sort of bundles. So let's, here, let me focus, let me take the case M being smaller or equal to six. Then there, there are two, diff, two interesting classes of bundles. So this is the kind of the, the M theoretical one, this is the type two we want. So, the, so if you've seen them uh, in the talk of them in the previous one, or at least the first one. And the claim is again that there is a sort of bracket structure on that, which has some nice properties. And instead of an inner product, there exists a G structure where G is this product of the split real form of the exceptional Lie group and of the scaling. I will just refer to it as G. And the, the claim is that the, this, this thing together with this bracket and this structure, again, gives you some nice object, which for instance, this bracket satisfies some Jacobi identity or Leibniz identity. It preserves this structure, and there is all sorts of nice compatibility conditions that you can think of. And you can ask the same question again. Is it possible to find a Leibniz parallelization of that? And what compact manifold do admit such a parallelization? And now, probably at this point, I should make some connection to physics. So, so the reason why you're interested in such a question is, uh, first of all, it's interesting, but second of all, uh, probably more importantly, it, it corresponds to maximally supersymmetric consistent truncations. And also, it provides a very natural way to think about Poisson and U duality. So that's what I'm going to for now. Uh, but first, there are some brief pictures. So the ingredients that we need to build this exceptional algebra that I want to talk about is that you need to have a group, which in our case is just this one. And we are taking two representations, which we call E and N, which in particular, there is a symmetric map from E tensor E to N. And in the cases that we'll be interested since in, I said that we only consider case up to n equals six. So you have the E6, E5, E4, and E3 case. And the black node is the, is the, the fundamental representation corresponding to that is the, is the E representation and the N corresponds to the blue one. So I'm not giving you the precise formulas, but yeah, I mean, they are basically those fundamentals. And uh, I should say that um, one can try to embed this, or one can try to treat this story also in, in, the, in the language of tensor hierarchies, but what we are doing here is basically we are taking only the first, or like only, the, only two representations out of that and kind of truncating the thing. And it turns out that for the purposes of what I want to show that actually enough for, for, for this, for the purposes that, for this was only you duality. And, but yeah, I mean, one should really think of it perhaps in terms of this infinite chain of representations. But for us, this will be enough. So now let me give you a definition. So an exceptional algebraoid, or shortly just algebraoid, 
uh, is given by the following data. So it's basically the same as for current algebraids, except that you replace the inner products kind of. So you have a vector bundle, you have a bracket, you have an anchor map, and you have a G structure. In the case of current algebra, this G structure was replaced by an inner product, which is the same as an ODD structure. And uh, here I'm also committing this slight abuse of notation that I will denote, I will use the same letters for these two representations and for the associated bundles. So, so what I really mean here is that this, this, e, this E vector bundle, it lies in this E representation, and there is an associated N bundle, which is a bundle over M also. And again, there is a, some bunch of compatibility conditions which are kind of extracted from current algebraids. Uh, and I'm not going to write what they are. You can find them in the papers. But kind of the whole point of these compatibility conditions and of this definition is to show the following statement. So first of all, there is a statement, again, that there is, it's possible to, to kind of abstractly characterize which exact, or sorry, which exceptional algebraids are of this form. And the statement goes as follows. So there is a natural sequence given, which follows from these axioms. It's given by, well, just, just some sequence of vector bundle maps. And the claim is that uh, the algebraid is of this form if and only if this sequence is exact. And as you see, there is, there is two possibilities. There is, this, uh, there is this M theoretic one, and then there is the type 2B one. So that corresponds to these two possibilities. So you have this bifurcation, which you don't have for current. For current, you have just like one. There is one exact current algebra locally. Sorry, I didn't say this was a, this was, this is actually a local statement here. Locally, you have just one exact current algebra, but here you have two. You have the M theoretic one and the type 2B one. But this is well known in the, well, in the other, well, if you talk about it in the other language of like consistent, sorry, uh, like, anyway. Um, yeah, and I should, so as I said, this is a local result. But you can you can study the global issues as well, and you get some interesting things. And uh, let me just say that it's more complicated. But one thing that you can do, you can introduce some twists. So, for instance, in the in the M theoretic case, you can have a one form and four form twist. So the four form twist, I guess, is is familiar to people. But the the one form one is a remnant of the fact that the, the language we are using it's kind of related to this warped compactification compactifications. And there should be also seven form plugs, but that one vanishes because we are all only you know and up to six and so in the empty case this one is actually closed so you can see it as a, as a u1 connection and then this thing is covariantly closed the f form flux and in the type 2b you get some more interesting stuff so this is our last paper so the analysis there is much more um much longer let's say but the result is elegant and the result is that you have again the, the possible twists there are given by by a one form valued in GL2, so you have a GL2 connection, you have a, you have two, three, you have a doublet of three forms, and you have a five form. And uh, again, this, this is, this is supposed to be a flat connection, and this is a, this is currently closed, and this thing has no condition on it because, uh, in 2B case, M is at most five dimensional, so this is automatically closed. So, yeah, so far for, so this is just about some global issues. And now to address the question of parallelizations, what we proved again, so the one, one, one kind of hard or relatively difficult claim was to prove this kind of correspondence. This is how, do, how, do, how does one recognize these exact ones? And then the second hard piece there was to actually prove this correspondence. So uh, the claim is that there is again a correspondence between exact parallelizable algebraids and some sort of Manin pairs, which we can call exceptional Manin pairs if you want. So remember before these Manin pairs, they corresponded of a quadratically algebra and the Lagrangian subalgebra thereof. In this case, well, you have the analog, you have this, we have, let's call them E and V. So E will be uh, algebra over a point. So in the previous case, this was a quadratically algebra. Now it's something more general, but it's given very explicitly in terms of these conditions. So you can write, con write conditions for what that is. In particular, the bracket here will not be skew symmetric, actually. That's a, a point I should say. And uh, instead of a Lagrangian subalgebra, we have uh, now something which we call Lagrangian subalgebra. So uh, let me maybe, yeah, let me not explain what that, it's a, it's a natural generalization of, of, of the one before. Uh, don't be confused about this word call here. It's okay. Let me not go into that. So, so it, so far it's just some natural analog. And then there is some, some technical conditions that you get here actually. Uh, 
which are kind of very mild. So for instance, you want that uh, the symmetric part of the bracket lies in this Collagrangian subalgebra, and you want that there is some sort of alignment of traces uh, where mu is some uh, concrete numbers, which I didn't write, depending on n. Um, thank you. And uh, yeah, so I should say that the result here, it, it also it mirrors a result by inverse opt in 2017. So what we have here is kind of putting that in a different language and there is some simplification achieved in here. I mean, as you see, like, these conditions are quite concise. And in particular, you can now say what is Poisson utility is just the case when you have two such subalgebras. Then you get the corresponding, the corresponding exact parallelizable algebraids, algebraids will be, you know, Poisson U dual. So yeah, let me go into examples. So first of all, the simplest one, so th these will be examples of these pairs. So each such pair will give rise to some parallelization, some Leibniz parallelization. So in the first case, if you take, in the simplest case, when you take the, everything abelian, so there is vanishing bracket, then, well, these two conditions are void and subalgebra is also void. So we basically only need to have an algebra, well, an, a vector space E and some Collagrangian subalgebra. And in that case, if you take the chorus, if you look at the corresponding space, so I didn't tell you how to pass from, from this exceptional Manin pair back here. So in the case of current algebra, this was given simply by, you know, you, you took the, the quotient of the groups. In this case, it's more complicated because there is no groups here because this, this thing is not the Lie algebra, but you can make a Lie algebra out of it if you mod out by kind of the nasty stuff. So, and what I'm saying is that there is eventually some sort of group quotient. And in this case, it's quotient of abelian groups, and then you get a torus. And because everything here is acted upon by the exceptional group, then you also have that there is different Collagrangian subspaces also form an orbit of the exceptional group. And in other words, you get basically, I mean, this, this different choices of such subalgebras will just correspond now to different choices of this subspace and they are related by the action of the exceptional group. So this is a standard story of the, of the ordinary U duality. Now you can generalize this slightly. Uh, if you start from a Lie algebra, so then you recover the first case if you take the algebra to be abelian. So if, so this is K. So if you take math frac K, any Lie algebra, presumably compact if you want compact result at the end, uh, then you can take, uh, you, you just mimic the construction of the exceptional tangent bundle. So we just take K plus which two K star plus which five K star and you take V to be this guy, the, this, this last two factors. And there is a natural bracket structure on this thing, which will make this thing into some, well, into precisely an algebraid over a point. So I'm not writing it down, but it, it basically, it's basically the same as the formula here, which I also didn't write down. And uh, yeah, and the quotient that you get at the end will be just the group K. So this, this example, you can, you should kind of think of it backwards, like because, because group is a nice parallelizable manifold by itself. So there is no wonder that it gives rise to parallelizations. This is just like to see, I went from the left to the right, just to demonstrate that you can also see it as a, some sort of pair E and V. And this is related to Schirk-Schwarz reductions. And also if you are interested in searching for dualities, so you can try to, for instance, one thing you can, you can do, you can try to deform this V inside E. You can find like some continuous family of deformations, you know, some, for instance, you can keep it transverse to K and deform it to correspond, then these deformations will correspond to some graphs. And then the condition for this to, to actually be a Lagrangian subalgebra, that's the Young-Baxter equation, or generalized Young-Baxter Young deformation. And so this was studied by, by Sakatani, Malik Thompson, and uh, yeah, and also some other things in this, I mean, uh, the situation was explored in more detail in, in their works. And uh, for one example, which is not given by group or, or two examples are the spheres. So for instance, if you take, if you take SO5 and SO4, then miraculously they seem to, they fit into this framework. And the quotient that you get is a four sphere is a, yeah, and S4, which is an M, M theoretic parallelizable space. And then a similar, but slightly more complicated one is give obtained by SO6 plus the sum of the two vector representations. And I need to, I should tell you also how the bracket looks like. So, uh, because the bracket here on this algebra, so he, well, so this will not be a Lie algebra. This, this part, this part is a, is a Lie subalgebra. This thing is left central. So bracket of this guy with anything vanishes, but the bracket of this guy and this guy is given by the action. That's how the structure looks like. 
and you take v to be this thing and the quotient then leads to a five sphere and this is actually an uh, an e6 case so this is a 2b parallelizable space okay so these are the examples there's not many more examples known especially compact ones thank you um but anyway let me let me finish by saying what else can be done using this wonderful machinery of algebraids? So one thing that you can do, you can generalize this further. So you can go to, is if you recall, then the, the ingredients to, put, to construct such a thing consisted of a group and a pair of representations. So you can take different choices of this data, and this is what we call G-algebraids. So for instance, if you take GLN with the vector representation and the trivial N, then you get Lie algebraids. I mean, the, the, the corresponding things satisfying these axioms will be Lie algebraic. If you take O and N with the vector representation and the and the trivial one, where where the again, sorry, let me go back. So you an important part is also this map. So in in the ODD case, this map will be just the inner product. And if you look at the, the at the details, then modulo some details, you will get Quran algebraic. Another interesting case is if you if you if you generalize this uh, E44 case. Which is, which is which was studied in, in in this paper so there you get basically you have two two forms and four forms and the and the map is taking simply the wedge so you wedge two two forms and that's a symmetric operation and so those two i mean the first two carry a name this one doesn't have a name maybe or maybe it does i don't know uh, but yeah, in one of the questions is like what are the other possible group setups so like do they lead to something interesting do they lead to something physically relevant so that's one of the open questions. <clears throat> and then another thing you can do, you can build and generalize Einstein-Hilbert action so following, following this work. That, that's also what we did in one of the papers. Uh, you can, you can like, on a general uh, exceptional algebra, you can, you can build a generalization of the, of the, of the Ricci scalar and Ricci, Ricci tensor, and you can, you can write down the an action functional which reproduces the equation, sorry, which reproduces the, the action of the relevant supergravity. And then it, it follows almost effortlessly in this framework that you have a compatibility between, between Poisson and U duality and supergravity. It's really just like uh, one line uh, observation in this framework. So that's, that's, that's what this kind of suited for. And now the, what can one do with it next? So what's the things that we are interested in is to look at the 2A case, for instance, which is so this was M theoretic one and the 2B case. The 2A case is different and more complicated because it's not extremal. It's like the, the, um, in the usual EFT language, it would correspond, I believe, to saying that the solution of the section constraint is not maximal or minimal. It, it's just, well, yeah. And that, that leads to complications. But yeah, so it, in this language, it leads to some, also some interesting questions. So for instance, one expects, thank you, that there will be no longer uh, this kind of unique characterization or just two cases, but you will have some moduli there. And then you can look at non-maximal consistent truncations, non-maximally supersymmetric, or you can try to do the classification because now the conditions here are fairly simple. So you can, if you work for low n, you can probably do it without, I mean, you can probably do it. So that's another thing, like what are the possible such pairs and yeah and then there is the usual stuff you can try to super symmetrize it you can look at uh, you can these are uh, yeah you can look at other other g algebraids and see how they're related to some interesting physical questions and uh, yeah so that's, that's it thank you very much for your attention For a nice talk. Are there any um, questions on this? I have a couple of questions. So, the first one in a 2A case, one way of making it maximal is by including the Roman's mass. Mm -hmm. Then you can't extend this, the solution of the section condition. Mm -hmm. um, is it obvious? what your story would look like for massive type 2a or is will it be uh it's uh well i don't know if it's obvious but okay so so 
Oh, I cannot switch the slides. Can you make? Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so so um, kind of the 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 hard part of or like the only non-trivial part of this thing was to prove this kind of correspondence between that and that. And that, that's just like some some straightforward but slightly tedious calculation. And if you just go through the calculation for the two AKs, then you then you then you get the well, yeah. So actually, what you get there is that you, you get two possible scalars in, as the deformations, but like the, one of them has to vanish. But it can, if I remember correctly, and one of them should be the Roman's mass, and the other one should be the other thing that you can deform the, the theory with. I think there is there is some something like that, right? Yeah. So so it, it kind of follows it follows up naturally from 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 this thing. You, you, if you just if you just the strategy is just like you take this thing, impose the that this is exact, and then you just look look at what it gives you. It's like straightforward calculation, and it, it gives you all the possible fluxes. And in the two A case, it will give you these two scalar deformations. If if you can, we even tried like going one dimension lower, where it gets really messy and uh, probably more interesting as well. And um, another question, I think you had a point about it in your last slide. Um, so can you use something like this to describe more general structures, for example, Dan's generalized SC7 structures and seeing what manifolds admit them? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm afraid we haven't looked at that yet. So um, I would hope so, but I, I no, it, we really didn't, didn't, didn't look at it yet. Yeah, that is a very good question and I don't have an answer for that very. Any further questions from this audience? Doesn't look like it. Are there any uh, online questions? No. Then uh, let's thank Friedrich once more. And on to this morning's last talk. So the, the, this talk is by Yanis Kalogerakis, who will tell us about uh, large quantum number expansions in O2N vector models and resurgence. Please. Hello, and uh, I want to thank the organizers and the previous speakers. Actually, it's a great honor for me to be here. It's my first live talk in the, in the COVID area, and it happens in Greece and Corfu. So my talk will be about large quantum number expansion in the O2N vector model and resurgence. And there was already some introduction done by my supervisor, Susanna, this morning. So this, uh, uh, this talk is based on the paper that we wrote recently with uh, Susanna Referred, Domenico Orlando and Nicola Donti. And I want to again, ask your forgiveness uh, a priori because I haven't uh, been very careful with uh, references, but uh, you can find everything in the archive paper and in the published paper. So let me start by giving an outline of my talk. First thing first, I will try to introduce uh, what I'm going to talk about. And uh, then I will uh, give some results from the large Zen that have most of you have already seen from the morning in any case. And then I will briefly talk, uh, talk about the research and analysis and then move on to the world line instantons. And I will look at two specific cases, the case of the torus and the sphere, before concluding my talk. So at this point, let me start uh, with the introduction. And what is the large quantum number expansion? And as uh, Susanna said in the morning, it's limited to theories with global symmetries. And it actually allows analytic treatment of otherwise inaccessible systems. And as most of you already know, the C most of the CFTs, they lack nice limits when they become simple and solvable. But in the presence of a symmetry, we can find sectors of the theory where the OP coefficients and the anomalous dimensions simplify. 
and we can actually calculate them. So the idea here is that uh, we study subsectors of the theory uh, with fixed quantum number Q, where Q is the charge, and that in each sector, uh, we use the large charge as a controlling parameter in an now perturbative expansion. So in this talk, I will uh, consider the O2N vector model in two plus one dimensions. And uh, this uh, model five um, goes to an uh, IR, it flows to an IR fixed point, which is a conformal fixed point, a Wilson fixer fixed point. And uh, actually we can use the state operator correspondence and we can compute the, uh, the scaling dimension of uh, the lowest primary operator of fixed charge. And we have the result right here. So we can see that it scales with the charge and there are two terms, this one and this one, that uh, from the effective field theory point of view, these are Wilsonian coefficients and they cannot be computed, but we can have some results from the large N. And then the first term goes as q to the three halves. There is a subleading term that goes as q to the one half. And then there's this term, which is actually uh, uh, present in all ON models. And then there are subleading terms that goes as q to the minus one half. And what I want you to remember is that first, this number here is a prediction of the theory because this uh, is a quantum correction, is the Casimir energy of the type one Goldstone and does not get renormalized by any other quantity in the theory. And also from lattice simulations, we found out that the large charge expansion only also works for small charges. And the question is why? And that's what we tried to answer. So there is no reason for the large charge expansion to work outside of the scope of the effective field theory. But what we can try to do is that we can add another parameter like the large N and we can try to go beyond the scope of the effective field theory. In which case in the double scaling limit where large Q is going to infinity, large N is going to infinity and the ratio between these two which I uh, note as a Q small hat is constant. Uh, we can uh, solve the problem exactly at the leading n for any va value of small q hat. And uh, we can show that in the double scaling limit, uh, we have an asymptotic expansion. And the thing is that uh, asymptotic expansion uh, means that they are, it indicates that they are non-perturbative phenomena in the theory, that they are present. And uh, modern days, this goes under the name of resurgent asymptotics or simply resurgence. And at this paper, what we did was use the research techniques to find out what number two body phenomena are present. And at the end, we extrapolated our result to small charge Q, since the result is valid for any value of Q. And in the double scaling limit, since we have a good, uh, uh, we, we can uh, control the theory, we can also have the small uh, charge expansion and we can match the results. And it's, uh, it's uh, amazing precision. So let me now uh, talk about some results from large N. Um, and the model that I'm starting, with, I'm starting with is the Laddown Ginsberg model uh, for N complex field in two plus one dimension with Euclidean signature on R times M, where M is a Riemannian compact manifold. And uh, the action is the following up to mass dimension two. And uh, this uh, system close to a Wilson fixer things point in the infrared. Uh, if it's fine, the R is fine tuned to the conformal coupling and U goes to infinity. And we work in sector of fixed charge Q. And uh, we are interested at free energy at criticality. So um, in the limit that N goes to infinity, again, Q goes to infinity and this ratio is fixed. We can find out that we express the free energy as the Lezen transform of a zeta function. And we can use this to write uh, some equation for the quantities uh, in the theory that we were interested in. And this is the free energy per degree of freedom, which is this small f uh, of the hat Q, also for the charge Q and for the grand potential, which is omega M, where M is a chemical potential. And omega M is written in terms of a zeta function. And this is the Harwood zeta function of, the, of this operator. In the 
our work is easier to work uh, in the Molino presentation of the Velzeba function that I have written here. And uh, the large charge, as you can see from uh, before, corresponds to large M. And uh, when M is taking large, this integral localizes around t equals zero. So now the large charge problem simplifies to the problem of veil asymptotics. And this can be written in terms of silly width coefficients. So we have a perturbative uh, analysis for the trace. The thing is, what happens if we want to go beyond this analysis? And uh, in order to compute the heat trace, we can do it in two ways. The first is through a resurgent analysis of the spectrum of the operator. And the second one is using a geometric interpretation in, in uh, terms of world line instantons. So although I want to concentrate mainly in the world line instanton technique, let me first uh, talk about, give you a brief recap of the research and analysis. And the procedure is the following. Uh, we start by writing the spectrum of the operator. And uh, for the cases that we have tried, which is the torus, and the sphere, uh, the torus is easy and wanted to check out. The sphere is because we can use a state operator correspondence. The spectrum of the, oper of the Laplacian operator is easy to write. And then we write the heat kernel as a sum. And at this point, we want to use Poisson resummation and expand around the appropriate limit, which is the t going to zero plus. So first is the case of the torus, which is sort of trivial. Because the thing is that the heat trace here can be written as a square of the theta function. So after doing the Poisson summation, the end result is this particular one. And this sum does not include the zero mode. On the other case, uh, the sphere is much more complicated because there are ambiguities that arise here. And uh, we can do the above procedure and uh, we end up with an outcome that is written in terms of the Dawson function, which in, uh, can also be written in terms of the imaginary error function. And by analyzing the Dawson function, you can find out that uh, uh, it's asymptotic and uh, actually it's factorially growing. And this is an indication that we can complete our uh, series, our result into a research and run series. And uh, at this point, I don't want to go into too much details about the recenter trans series, but I can talk about it more at the end if anybody is, is interested. But we can uh, find out the formal definition of a research and trans series. We can compare it with the result that we have uh, in our case. And by comparing the result, we found out that the heat kernel trace has to contain these terms. And uh, you can see this SK here that is related to Stoke constant. And actually, all this result can be is ambiguous because it's defined up to this SK complex constants. And uh, the problem is that uh, we cannot fix this ambiguity from this analysis. And uh, the explanation is that the fact is that this trans series has, for any value of the SK, has uh, the same formal solution as a, perturbative, as a perturbative asymptotics. So how to get rid of this ambiguity and also how to make a sense of this factorial divergence series. And the way that we did is that, uh, sorry, we actually use the Borel summation. So we used another similar research and analysis of the Dawson function. And we took the, the Borel uh, transform of the Dawson function in which case we ended up with uh, an integral representation of the heat trace that has also been found in previous works, but now it can be defined as a Borel integral. The problem is that uh, this integral has poles in the integration line, which now becomes a Stokes line. And in order to avoid this, uh, comple uh, this complex problem, we defined lateral Borel transforms that go either up or down of the poles. And the end result is that this lateral Borel transform give us exactly this term. So now we have an analysis of this, diverge, of this uh, factorial uh, equation here because this, uh, its term corresponds to a pole in the real axis of the Borel plane. 
how to fix the ambiguity from the research and analysis. The thing is that we can't exactly, but what we can do is that we can impose the reality condition of the heat rays, in which case this SK is fixed to minus plus one half. And then we have an unambiguous result. But there is a different way, and this way is based on one line instantons. And uh, here, the motivation about world line instantons is that there is, is a geometric interpretation that is completely independent of the large N. And uh, you can see that because now we have a result that is based on the properties of the commodification manifold and not on an analysis of the operator. And um, the idea besides this is that green function of elliptic operators can be written in terms in a representation of quantum mechanical path integrals. And the word line formalism is to try to find the appropriate uh, quantum mechanical integral that computes the determinant of the given operator. And uh, heat trace can uh, be interpreted as free particles uh, moving, uh, as uh, free particles moving on the curve manifold at hand. So the starting point of this calculation is that we want to uh, write to find the functional determinant in the finger representation of this. And uh, in a product manifold, uh, like R times M, the trace in the swinger uh, integral, fact uh, the swinger integral factorizes, so we can directly uh, examine the heat trace. And uh, we can choose a coordinate system, X of mu, on the manifold, in which case the classical action of the free particle takes the following form. And uh, Jimmy mu is the metric on the manifold, while X is the one line that is described by the motion of the free particle. And uh, doing this, we can write the heat trace uh, that is related to a path integral over closed loops. And we will take this form here to be our definition of the path integral. There is some small problem with the use of this formalism that has mainly to do with the fact that there uh, is intrinsic differomorphism invariance and there are also are ambiguities that merge by the normal ordering of the uh, Hamiltonian because of the Kerberter terms. But at least these problems can be resolved in the semi-classical approximation near the classical solution. And um, it's, uh, they are all uh, subleading in T, so this won't be a problem. Uh, so as I said, in the limit that it goes to zero plus, this is in classical expansion. And by rescaling the world line time as following, we can find uh, that the action takes this form. And you can, see from, you can see from here that small t corresponds in uh, expansion in H bar in this quantum mechanical system. So we are interested in the equation of motion from this action. So we found the earlier Lagrange equation. And these are geodesic equation uh, in the following form. And uh, the path integral localizes on a sum over all closed geodesics gamma on the manifold at hand. So now we'll try to take the cases of torus and then the sphere. The easy one is the torus and we take the manifold as T square. It's a square torus of side L. And the metric is uh, easy to find, it's this one. So now we can define the heat trace uh, via this path integral. And in the limit that T goes to zero plus, uh, this can be computed semi-classically via saddle point approximation. So now we can represent the torus as R square, and we identify X as X plus L. And in this case, uh, we can see that it becomes a lattice of uh, similar squares. And let's say that we fix a point, for example, here the origin. And uh, then we can see that closed geodesics are just straight lines that they connect the point, uh, the origin with the point. And it's easy now to find out that we can label the closed geodesics by a pair of integers, k1 and k2. Um, and the corresponding length is easy to find for the closed geodesic, and it's this one. 
So we want to decompose our field in the usual manner, uh, and we want to write it as a sum between classical solution and fluctuations. And um, since the action is quadratic, since the square is flat, we can separate the three, contrib the three contributions in the following manner. And here we have the classical contribution of the action, and here is the fluctuations. And uh, then we can uh, write the path integral, and it takes this particular form. And this integral here is that we included the point at the origin. So we have to include an integral uh, for the point that we have fixed. And this integral is Gaussian and can be calculated. And you can use that of function regularization or any other technique that you like. And then you can calculate that up to normalization constant. And in our case, we have chosen our normalization constant to be this one because it's the usual thing that they use in the word line uh, formalism. And putting everything together, you can see that the final result for the heat kernel trace is the one that we had from before, but now it comes from a geometric interpretation of the torus. So this was a good thing. We have the same result as before. And now let's go to the case of the sphere. Well, here things are a little bit more complicated. And um, we have to find a Bloy and natural generalization of the flat space path integral, in which case we use this one. The good thing is that ambiguities that emerge as something in T, so in leading order, we don't have a problem. And what we're going to do is that we can use the standard polar coordinates for the sphere and uh, of uh, theta comma phi. And now the volume element uh, takes this particular form. And we have our word line fields, which is theta and phi. And we are interested in the equation of motion and the action of these um, fields. So the action and uh, the equation of motion can be seen in these three equations here. And since we are interested in the heat trace, uh, the heat kernel trace, we consider coincident endpoints for our fields. And there are many, uh, infinitely many winding geodesics that uh, satisfy the equation of motion, uh, but the classical solution can be parameterized in this manner. And then we can introduce fluctuation around uh, the classical solution, and these fluctu fluctuations have to satisfy Dirichlet boundary condition. So now we can rewrite the heat kernel at wasted points in the following way. And uh, you can see two things. First of all, the integral over HF is massless. So this gives us, again, uh, our previous normalization constant, which is nice. But the integral over H theta contains a zero mode and also contains multiple negative modes. Um, and this can be seen by expanding the fluctuation in an orthonormal, orthonormal basis of the modes that they satisfy these two equations. Then we can write explicitly uh, these results. And from here, we can see that for n equals 2k, there is a zero mode. And for n smaller than 2k, there are tachyonic modes. Also, the integration measure can be written uh, using Fourier modes like this. So now let's uh, take a little bit, let's see a little bit more these things here. And there are 2k minus 1 tachyonic modes, as you can see. Uh, from the first uh, figure that we have uh, in the picture here. And uh, the presence of tachyonic mode is not really unnatural. And we can see that because we can uh, contract uh, this to a single point. Then, uh, on the other hand, the zero mode is another story because the zero mode is just a symmetry of the quadratic uh, action and it has to be treated separately. The last picture here, these are massive modes that they fluctuate around the classical solution. So if we put all the results together, we can find out that the heat trace has the following form. And you can see that this form here agrees completely with uh, the form that we had from the research and analysis. The bonus here is that 
it doesn't have an ambiguity that we have to input any extra physical input to fix. So this result comes out naturally from uh, the uh, path in, from the path integral. So the final real, and uh, I have to specify this in an ambiguous result for both the procedures is this one. And actually here you can see uh, the first term is exactly the um, uh, integral uh, representation of the heat trace uh, that we have found as the Borel integral. And this is the term of the ambiguity. So the end result is this particular one. Good thing about this is that we now have a close expression for the heat trace, for the heat kernel trace, and we can write the exact expression of the ground potential, which is valid for any value of small hat Q. And also in the double scaling limit that we have a very good control of the system, we can also have a small charge expansion of our system, and we can numerically compare the two results. And we found out that they agree to at least eight digits. And the reason that we could not go beyond the eight digit is that it takes a whole day for a computer to produce another digit from the resurgent uh, point of view. So let me now conclude. First of all, we saw that the large charge expansion at the Wilson Fisher fixed point is asymptotic. And in the double scaling limit, we control the perturbative expansion. The fact that we have a geometric interpretation of the non-perturbative corrections is really important because uh, now uh, this allows us uh, to go beyond the large uh, N. So um, the fact that these are uh, finite volume effects, uh, they kind of allow us to go to large size but finite N results. And also we can uh, propose an exact form of the grand potential. This is good. And at the end, we conjecture that the large size expansion is always asymptotic. And actually it has an optimal truncation of n going as square root of q and instead of q that we thought before. And this is actually consistent with the lattice results that we have for the O2 and from the O4 case. Thank you very much. Thank you for a nice and well-timed talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any questions? Niels has one. Uh, I can, yeah. The last point uh, of your list, this optimal truncation, I didn't really understand. Here. Uh, okay, so the thing is that, um, as I said, at the very beginning, I have to go a little bit back, sorry. This is written in terms of these coefficients. And these are Wilsonian coefficients. But uh, using the, in the double scaling limit that we really have uh, uh, control over these parameters, we can put uh, a limit to exactly how these coefficients will scale. And uh, we found out that they scale as square root of Q at the end. So we assume that this procedure can go beyond the large N because of the geometric interpretation that we had, in which case we can uh, have an optimal truncation of how these uh, things will grow. Other questions? Do we have any questions from the virtual audience? No? In which case, let's thank Yanni once more. <laughs> Looks like the boss wants to say something.